Hello guys and gals, and this is part 20 of our reading of Pandora's Jeans. It is a novel, a really, really good novel by Catherine Lance. And really, if I'm being completely honest, really ahead of its time considering it was, it was published back in 1985. And I think that it really is poignant for today, you know, even still valid today, all the points that are made in this book. Also, it is part of a trilogy. I always bring that up. Um, Pandora, uh, Pandora's Genes is the first book of the trilogy. Pandora's Children, the second, and Pandora's Promise, the third. So if you want to find those books, I think most of the booksellers still have them. Maybe some of the bigger ones, anyways. Or maybe a local library, if you want to get your own copy. Anyways, we are going to go over the copyright information which is um, right here, copyright right here on the screen, copyright 1985 by Catherine Lance, all rights reserved, and I have the author's written permission to read this book on my YouTube channel. So, special thanks to the author for that. Anyways, in the last episode, um, we found out that Zach was alive. I think we probably found that out two episodes ago. But um, anyways, this is more of Zach's struggle as he is. Um, I think they're trying to brainwash him. And then they tortured him some. But um, we're, we are going to um, pick up where we left off. Let me go back to the picture here. Oops, there we go. So, let's go. Ah. We're going to go back a few paragraphs, as always, basically just so I can make sure. I don't remember exactly where we left off because it was a week ago when I recorded the last one. So we are going to start at the top of page 211. Um, okay. She looked up, surprised. It is something that, something the women in my family have always known, she said. He hesitated and spoke again. You have always seemed to me different from the other traitors. Are you a true believer? She shrugged. What's important is that they treat me better than anyone did before. My husbands used to make fun of my face and beat me. Yash says that my face doesn't matter. He says I have a beautiful soul. Zach nodded thoughtfully. Yash didn't, in, didn't in fact, seem to notice that Jonah, is, it's J-O-N-N-A, and I'm pronouncing it Jonah. I don't know if it's, I'm pronouncing it right or not. But um, we'll say Jonah. Oh, wait, I lost my place now. Notice that Jana was different from the other women. It must be terrible, he thought, to be a woman scorned in a world where women were a rarity. I haven't been with them very long, she went on, but Yash has ordered us to return to the traitor capital. He's told, it, he's told me I will receive true instruction there. When is this trip to, that to take place, Zach asked, suddenly alert. Tomorrow, or so Ga Galen, Galen, Galen tells us. We've been packing all day. That night, Zach lay awake long after everyone else in camp was asleep. His hand, his hands and wrists hurt badly, and he was not certain that he would be able to withstand more questioning. If indeed Galen did, didn't plan simply to kill him in the, in the morning. He had hoped to be able to find out the location of the traitor capital, but saw now that he had already waited too long to make his move. There was a guard outside his tent, he knew, he, and an unknown number of sentries at the perimeter of the camp. Raising his voice only as much as necessary, he called out for the guard. After a moment, a young trader entered, looking annoyed and sleepy. What is it? I can't sleep from the pain. Can you untie my hands just for a while? I suppose it'll be all right, the young man said. Brother Yash left word that you were to be made comfortable. He stooped and loosened the bonds, Zach, freeing Zach's hands from the tent pole. Zach had, had thought to overpower him, but the risk of noise was too great unless he killed the man immediately. And he didn't want to do that. Thank you, he said. He turned over and closed his eyes and began to breathe slowly. He waited until the guard had come and gone twice, checking on him. Then he got to his feet and quickly went to the back of the tent, where he awkwardly removed the stakes that held, held it to the ground. Then he wriggled out into the night, not five feet away from, 
not fi not five feet away, was one of the perimeter guards sitting motionless in the dim moonlight. Moving as slowly and silently as he could, Zack crawled along the ground towards the nearest growth of, of bushes, then got to his feet and began to run. He was disoriented and oh, he was disoriented in the dark, and had been away from the camp for only a few minutes when he heard shouts. He stopped and tried to decide which direction would most likely lead to safety. There was the sound of men crashing through the, the brush and the smoky glow of torchlight. He stopped thinking and simply ran, his breathing heavy and painful from, from the weeks of con convalescence. It was growing light when Zack suddenly came to a sheer rock face. He could hear the traders behind him drawing nearer. He looked up knowing that it would be a difficult climb even with undamaged hands. Still, it was his only chance. He pulled off his tunic and wrapped it tightly around his right hand for protection, then ignored the pain. He forced his left hand to grip handholds as he began to inch upward. He had climbed perhaps one-third of the way when he heard a shout. Stop right there, Zack looked down. Gal Galen, Galen, rather, and another man had bows trained on him. I told Josh not to trust you, Ga Ga Galen said. The camp was noisy, with the town with the sound of tents being struck and protesting animals being loaded. All mid morning, Ga Galen and his aide approached Zach, where he sat bound securely to a tree. Zach supposed supposed that they had come to question him again before killing him. In the hour since his capture, he had given himself up to what seemed inevitable. Seemed to what seemed inevitable. He only hoped that he would maintain strength enough not to betray the garden. The two men untied Zack and guided him to where the trader caravan was waiting. Galen attached Zack's aching hands to the lead of one of the pack animals, and it was only when they began walking into the forest that Zack understood he was not to be executed. That was... Oh, executed. That, for whatever reason, the traders were, talk, were taking him, was oh, with them. To their base. Oh, so they're headed to the base. Okay. Chapter three. The trader capital was indistinguishable from any village in the district, though the level of construction of its few buildings was much more primitive than that found even in the most backward district areas. Crude cabins and roughly hewn logs, oh, of roughly hewn, hewn logs, roofed with sod and bark, surrounded the village square, a grassy park like meadow. At the northern end of the square was an altar carved of stone and sheltered by three walls and a roof of bows. At the, so the southern end was a low, solid structure built in the ruins of a pre-changed building. Its small, barred windows were nearly level with the ground and its roof barely high enough to accommodate a man. A man. This was the traitor prison. Zack had only minutes to see these details, no sooner had the caravan arrived than Yash, dressed in long, filthy robes, approached him, his face alight with sunny, open smile. Brother Zack, he said, embracing him. It's good to see you. Zack just looked in bewildered. What? He started to say, his mind exploding with questions. Yash shook his head. There's, n there's no time to talk now. This is where you will stay, he went on. It's for your own protection. I'll visit when I can. Still smiling, he turned to greet the other members of the camp, leaving Zack with Galen. Galen prodded him through the low door and down a narrow flight of stairs to a tiny dark room illuminated by a single fish oil lamp. The jailer, a stout man with a red face and tangled deep black beard, looked Zack up and down. So this is the famous prisoner from the district, he muttered. We, we know how to take care of Scientists here, he unlocked the door behind him and led Zack through the narrow corridor and down another short flight of steps. What had evidently been the basement of the ancient building. The ceiling was so low that Zack, Zack's hair brushed it, and the only illumination came from flickering torches set in the wall at either end. The walls were of mortared stone, mortared stones, and four thick wooden doors faced each other two on each side of the room. Each door was held shut by three massive metal bars secured in, front, in iron holders. 
There was a small peephole the size of a man's fist near the top of each door, except for a faint moaning from behind one of the doors. The hall was as silent as, as it was dark and malodorous. At the second door in from the steps of the stairway, the jailer stopped, stopped and his powerful muscles bunched slid the three bars to one side. He swung the door open and told Zack to enter. Zack hesitated a moment, trying to see into the dim cell beyond. Then Galen jabbed his ribs with something sharp. He says to go in. The door slammed shut, and Zack listened to the bars being set into their holders. While his eyes adjusted to the gloom, the cell was constructed of heavy blocks of stone, carefully mortared into place over the ruined ancient walls. Across from the door was a small barred window just above the level of the ground not quite the height of zack's head and perhaps the length of his forearm in width the cell was only a few feet across and in and its length was just enough for zack to stretch out although the wall below the window was oh, along the wall below the window was a pile of straw spread with a rough wooden blank wo woolen blanket to the right of the door was a small opening in the stone slightly larger than the earthenware bowl set just inside it. The floor uh, of pre-changed concrete was uneven and cracked, and scattered spots of with scattered spots of mildew. As soon as he heard the third of the bars slip into place, Zach inspected the cell closely, looking for some means of escape. The narrow window was out of the question. It was no, it was not large enough to put his head through, and even should he be able to enlarge it, it would take him weeks and would easily be observed from the outside. The door was massive and unmovable. Only a little opening for, for the chamber pot showed any hope of yielding, and again, any work he did would be readily observed from the outside hall, where he soon discovered a guard patrolling regularly. His only hope for escape would be to somehow to break through the floor and tunnel outward and up like a mole. Not only would, that, would such work be risky, he realized, that it would probably take him years to accomplish. Feeling tired and weak and sick from the march after weeks of inactivity, he sat on the, he sat on the, the straw pallet, his back against the rough stone wall. It was late afternoon, and the light filtered, filtering through the window was bright enough only to pick out shadows in the corner of the gloomy cell. There would be no escape from this prison in the usual physical sense. He did not know how he could endure being so confined away from fresh air and sky and trees. Execution would have been preferable. N not, he told himself, that execution would have been ruled out. He could not fathom why he had been brought here. Was, was there to be a public trial in which he would be denounced as a scientist? Was he to be repeatedly questioned until every bit of of information about the district was forced from him. Whatever would be, he hoped it would happen soon. He felt that he could not stay here for more than a very few days without losing his mind. He was to be in prison for nearly five years. The first month of his confinement was the bitterest of Zack's life. Every day he hoped for a word from Yash, but his guards who twice daily brought food and water and emptied his, the chamber pot, refused to answer questions or to engage in any conversation. His lone fellow inmate was, as nearly as he could tell, completely mad. He was given to periodic maniacal shrieking and sometimes, and seemed to be deaf, oh, he seemed to be too deaf to respond to any questions, questioning. Zach kept for quickly forgot about him, adding the weird noises to the background of constant discomfort. He learned how poorly designed the prison was the first time it rained. Water dripped down the walls through the window, soaking his bed. Moving the straw to the corner of the cell helped only a little bit, and the weather grew colder. Snow drifted in, and tiny icicles formed beneath the bars of his window. The food was monotonous and barely enough to sustain him, consisting of thin porridge with an occasional vegetable or bit of new fowl, and hunks of dark, tasteless bread. At night, the rats and insects which shared his cell ran about freely, 
brushing his arms and face as he tried to sleep. He slept poorly. In any case, even his dreams were of the cell. For the first few days, he spent long hours gazing out the window, watching the poorly dressed, humorless traders as they went about their business. Once he was startled by a small child, child's face peering into the window. Before he could say anything, the boy's mother angrily called him away. After several weeks of this, he turned his back to the window and simply sat on the straw, resting against the wall. His hands were still swollen, and, and the discomfort seemed to extend to his arms and into his whole being. His food, which had been eaten hungrily at first, was now left nearly untouched. He, he stopped asking the guards questions, stopped demanding to see Yash. No matter what the weather, he was always too—he was always too cold, shivering under the blanket. Daily, he could feel his skin becoming slack and his muscles disappearing. Oh, and his muscles disappeared, and felt his eyesight was growing dim, as was his mind. He thought he, that he was slipping towards death or madness, either of which would bring welcome relief from the intolerable confinement. Sometimes he thought of the principal and of Evie wondering if either were, was still alive. He began to spend more time in his memory remain, remaining, oh, returning to the cell only when bodily needs forced him. His memories became waking dreams for him, more vivid and real than anything in the cell. This building, this town, gradually he moved farther and farther back in his mind until he reached the time in his life of greatest happiness and greatest sorrow. And brief period, the brief period of his marriage to Leia, let me check real quick. Okay, we're 16 minutes in. All he knew was that he wanted to mount to mount Leia as often as possible and to care for her in between, the way he had observed some animals taking care of, of their mates, licking them softly, curling beside them and giving warmth, and protecting them from whatever came. He would bring her food and skins to make clothes, clothing, and would build and keep for her a warm snug cabin with a roof which kept out rain and snow where they could be together in the evenings talking in front of the fire all he expected from leah was that she should be there and allow him to do these things for her for as long as their lives together would be he wanted from her far more than uh, he wanted from her far more but knew that she could not yet give it. For now, what he had was more than enough. Every week she smiled more often and sometimes laughed in her clear, high voice. Her work kept her from the cabin sometimes for days at a time, but that was all right too because she always came back. His work tending the crops and animals, cutting wood and guarding the, the surrounding woods kept him busy and content. He knew that Leia and the mistress wanted him back at the garden, at least some of the time, but he was not gifted in scientific work and felt that, that, and felt that what he could contribute here was far more important to his life and hers, as well as to the garden, another reason which he kept to himself, was that he could no longer enter the garden without remembering the night Will had left. Sometimes he wondered what Leia felt when she returned to the garden, but he never asked her. Uh, he had read enough of the history of the human race to know that he was as happy now as he could ever expect to be, and that there was no reason to think that his happiness would last. Oh, that this happiness would last. It was at the end of the three-day period that he knew she would be returning to him soon. He was surprised to hear a mount coming over the, the low hills through the shallow river, and when he saw that it was Leia, he knew immediately from the way she held herself that things had changed and that perhaps the happiness had ended. Uh -oh. Are you sure? Zack could not, could, could not help asking the, the age-old question, but he knew the answer before she gave it with a wan but fright, frightened smile. His atavistic, unbidden feelings of joy won the fight with the worry, and he enfolded her. I love you, Leia, he said. He held her so tightly that she could scarcely move. 
After a moment, she spoke. I know you too. I know you do. Week by week, the baby grew, and finally it showed in Leia, in her figure, and in the way she moved. Her moods changed even more quickly than usual, and he learned to be very patient with her. But it was not difficult because he had always known that she was not like him, and her happiness and sadness came and went quickly without leaving the tra- without leaving the traces that his own sometimes did. The dangers they never talked about, the possibilities, the life that would build, oh, the life they would build for the child, they discussed frequently. Of course, they both hoped and assumed that the child would be a male, and they picked out a name for him, Ilya, after his grandmother. Leia continued to work, but she went to the garden less frequently and stayed for shorter periods of time, and finally began to bring her work home with her, which Zack had long wished her to do. They had agreed that it would be most prudent for her to spend the final month at home. She returned from the garden on the final journey, on this final journey, in the company of two other women, on mounts laden with packs containing small cages of cages of, of the animals Leia had worked with, and the few small tools of her trade that the garden could spare that the garden could spare her. That night he was taken he had taken her into the into bed and in his arms and held her closely, dreaming of making love to her, but knowing that she did not want it now and wouldn't again until after the baby was born. He had sent for help as soon as Leia's contractions began, adding powdered color root to turn his signal fire thick and red. As was customary for fathers, he was sent away from the area of the cabin until the outcome of the labor was known. His wood stand was at a place equidistant between the cabin and the garden. It was a cloudy summer day, not really hot, but so humid with an impending rain, rainstorm that the least ex- exertion left him sweating and feeling tired. He positioned a log on the chopping block, brought the axe just above and behind his head, then swung it. Thunk. He did that this again and again, the movement the movements easy from long years of practice. Wood chips flew around him, stinging his bare chest and arms, cut wood piled up around him, and he br- and his breathing grew heavy as his arms began to tremble with the effort. He did not dare to stop afraid to lose the comforting sound of the axe blade biting into the wood. After a long time, his muscles stopped responding, and he was forced to rest for a moment. The sound of the woods became deafening. He heard birds calling their territorial limits to one another, insects scuttling in the leaves, and the warm breeze before the storm, pushing the branches of the trees. He shivered as the wind took the sweat covering his skin. Sighing, he sat on a log and examined the axe minutely. He had made it himself from an old pre-changed axe blade and a stout piece of hardwood. He had carved himself, carefully fitting it to hold the metal and binding the two pieces together with strong new vine ropes. The ancient blade was as shiny as it must have been when it was new. He took care to clean it, to keep it clean, with fish oil and sharp on his whetstones. There were nicks and scores in the metal, but it was probably, he thought, in nearly as good condition as when it had been made untold years ago. He ran his fingers over the blade and looked for signs of wear on the handle. This was the fourth handle he had made for the blade, carefully carving and polishing during long nights in the cabin, while Leia read or worked on her projects from the garden. He stood already feeling stiff and began to gather the wood he had cut into bundles of seven or ten each, tying them carefully with new vine and placing them on the side of his work area. In a small shelter he had constructed, a squirrel suddenly clambered down from a tree behind him. He turned startled to see the, the little animal poised on its hind legs, its nose vibrating with its breath, every nerve in its body stretched as it tried to sense possible danger. It looked at him, its black eyes as shiny as the axe blade. Then, just as abruptly, it ran up the tree and disappeared along a leafy limb. 
Check real quick. Okay, what, 24 minutes. Zach picked up the axe and began again to swing it, cutting the wood as if he could cut out everything else that was happening. Never had he worked so long and so hard. Soon there would be enough wood cut to last the garden through the entire winter, and there was already more than enough for him and Leia. He became aware of another sound and realized that it was his own breath. Rasping, wet, and too rapid, still he did not stop, not even when the raindrops finally began to fall, washing away the dirt and sweat, then soaking him as a summer cloudburst developed. He could scarcely see what was being what he was doing through the falling water, but still he swung the axe back and up and down, splitting each precisely placed log. As he did so, stop, stopping only to move more wood into position. Zack, he turned and he turned his axe half raised, poised to split another log. Her dead, her head and shoulders were covered with a dark shawl. The old woman stood looking at him. Her face was composed and without expression, and as soon as he saw it, he knew the worst had happened. He turned back and finished splitting the log, still on the block, and set the axe down. Then, as an afterthought, he picked it up again, holding it below the top of the handle near the blade, and walked after the mistress. They followed the trail side by side through the mud, neither saying a word, though, though once the old woman slipped on a wet rock, and Zack took her elbow and steadied to steady her. In his other hand, he still held the axe, gripping it so tightly that his short fingernails cut into his palm. Okay, we are going to have to stop that here. We have been reading from Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And if you want to get your own copy of this book, most booksellers still have it. It is part of a trilogy, though. Uh, the second book being Pandora's Children, and the third being Pandora's Promise. Um, and this is really a poignant book, I think. Really, really a good book. And special thanks to the author for letting me read it on my YouTube channel. Anyways, if you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring that bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way or join the Discord server, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.